Power to the people. Brothers and sisters, I'm so glad to see many of you here tonight. This is a joyous occasion for the People's Organization for Progress. When he came to us at our first meeting in May, he was Councilman Baraka. Today he is Mayor Elect Roz Baraka. We're so glad to have him here tonight. But this is also a sad day for us as we contemplate the passing of Sister Maya Angelou. So I would ask that all of you who would be so inclined, if we could stand and have a moment of silence for Sister Maya Angelou. Long live Maya Angelou. Long live Maya Angelou. There was a somewhat of a, a mix up on our schedule. As you know, our meetings don't start till 6.30, but our mayor being the revolutionary that he is, was here at six o'clock. <laughs> So we know that his time is precious and he has many other places to be this evening. So what I would like to do at this point, if the members would indulge me, is I'd like to entertain a motion that we table our business agenda for tonight. Is there a motion? It's moved by Charlotte, it's seconded by Ibn. Is there any discussion on the motion to table the business? Seeing no discussion on the motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, all abstain, the motion is carried. Tonight is a special program. We have two great presenters tonight. Uh, the one who was originally scheduled and has been scheduled for a month is Brother Baruti Kafele, internationally renowned black educator, give him a hand, Brother Kafele. He will be here shortly. But this is, a, again, this evening is a celebratory moment, a historic moment. Let me just say that I have known Ross Baraka since he was a little boy and used to be at Hikalo Imwalimu, and now I've seen him over the years grow up and become a leader in his own right. I'm so glad that the People's Organization for Progress could say tonight that we endorsed his candidacy because we believed him to be the right person for the job, and we're so glad that there was a people's victory on election night with the election of Ross Barak. This is a young man who is a son of Newark, born and raised in Newark, attended Newark public schools, graduated, went to Howard University where he distinguished himself both as a scholar and an actor could have gone on and had a career somewhere else, but his love was Newark, and he returned home to Newark, became a teacher, and eventually a, an administrator, became a vice principal, and then the principal of a high school, was appointed deputy mayor of Newark, which certainly gave him uh, the experience and background to eventually become mayor, was the deputy mayor what had a successful election as South Ward Councilman and moved from there to become 
mayor of Newark. We are here tonight, and I want to say that we in the People's Organization for Progress, we supported Mayor Baraka during his election, but we also want everybody to know that the real work is now, and now is when he needs our support the most. And I hope that all of us will do what we can to support the efforts of his administration. So tonight, I'm proud to bring to you Mayor-elect, and on July 1st, the next mayor of Newark, New Jersey, Ross J. Barack. Thank Larry Ham, of course. I want to give the chairman of the People's Organization for Progress a round of applause, right? Uh, for consistency, uh, more than anything. And I know it's difficult uh, to be consistent uh, in a place that constantly tries to uh, provide obstacles for you. Right, uh, so it's difficult to be consistent. So everybody that's a part of the People's Organization for Progress, that's on the ground every single day doing the work, need to be given a round of applause for their consistency. It's, it's especially in the in, in, in the crises that we uh, face in these cities and in this and in this country. Period. You know, it's particularly where where black, brown, and poor people live. Uh, in America, uh, the difficulties there is difficult to be consistent. I want to applaud you on the the, the over a hundred some odd days of of economic justice, uh, uh, justice standing out there on Springfield Avenue, 381 days. Uh, that, that was a historical feat uh, in and of itself. And I want to thank uh, the folks, especially the folks that are uh, Newark residents that came out and supported our election on May 13th that made it possible for us to defeat this machine the way uh, <laughs> it lined up against us, right? So I, I was telling um, uh, some other folks that, you know, we had the entire machine uh, against us, e even though they, they tried to characterize it another way. Yes. Uh, they, they did that for their own benefit, uh, hoping that the people would be asleep. Uh, they uh, said that I was the, uh, the, the candidate of the machine when the, the party boss in the North Ward supported uh, my opponent. The party in the East Ward supported them. The party uh, in the Central Ward supported them. The party in my ward in the South Ward mm. supported them. Mm. Uh, the party in the entire city except one uh, where, uh, where Senator Rice is. Thank God for Senator Rice. The West War Party uh, did, did not uh, support us. Uh, uh, that was the, the, excuse me, the West War did. The only ward in the city uh, where the party actually uh, did not go with the official party line. They stood their ground and said, we going with uh, Team Baraka. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to the district leaders and the residents and the folks up in the West Ward and Senator Rice for holding the line up there. Uh, not only that, we had uh, tons of money uh, against us. Uh, George Norcross and his brother in the South, uh, up here in the North, Joe DiVincenzo, uh, Senator Sweeney, and I was it was confirmed for me today that those folks were actually involved, uh, you know, putting money and people on the ground hoping uh, somehow to sway the voters here in the city of Newark to buy this election. Uh, the amount of money that was poured in from independent expenditures uh, because the Supreme Court has allowed uh, organizations to create themselves and spend unlimited amounts of money uh, in these campaigns and it doesn't allow you and as, as an individual, as a working person, to, to spend unlimited amounts of money. If you do that, there's a cap on it and, and you can be fined and the campaign can be fined, but I could set up something and the Koch brothers can basically spend, write a $800,000 check and put it in a campaign 
to, to fight people's struggle. But here in Newark is an example of what can be done, not just uh, in the cities, uh, in the state of New Jersey, but all over the country. And I just want us to be aware of that because what happened here is unique, right? So we, we had a groundswell of union support, uh, uh, very strong union support. Uh, CWA and 32BJ, the first two unions to uh, come aboard and the folks began to follow and they began to organize that. Uh, so you had uh, labor support, you had community support, you had grassroots uh, uh, kind of support, and old fashioned door-to-door uh, -door street politics that uh, defeated the kind of money, the gross amount of money that they poured into this campaign, mm. right? Uh, and not only that, uh, 20 mailers that came to people's homes, uh, TV ads, uh, my, my, my daughter, uh, you know, had to watch those TV ads and was upset by the, the ads that were going on and on and on and on and on uh, uh, like that. But at the end of the day, we prevailed, right? And, and I say we prevailed because we, we did, we prevailed. Uh, the, the city prevailed, not, not me, we, we, we did this collectively together and the that was just the first leg. So the, the second leg begins with how we begin to uh, govern a city uh, uh, of this size in the financial crisis that it's in, given the traps that they're trying to set, that they've set historically for leaders to fall in. How do we govern in a city like this with a hostile, uh, uh, you know, somebody called me hostile, you know. <laughs> We're, 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 we're kind of hostile folks trying to make sure uh, that you don't get the things that, that you need, where the schools are under state control, where they're threat to take over the finances, where the police department is under threat of federal uh, control. All of these things are happening uh, in this town. And so it means that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done going forward. And we need the help of folks to be involved in this, not just you know, uh, your, your, your love and your support, but your mind, your activity, your work, your showing up to meetings, your being a part of what's going on, to be the ground troops, if necessary, when necessary, to be able to, to, to show up when, and show out when the time comes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's very important. So you never let people uh, tell you that uh, one form of struggle is outdated. You never let people tell you that you can't use this weapon as opposed to another weapon. How do people get to uh, organize your problems and then prescribe the way that you get out of them? It, it doesn't make sense. And so when people say that you're too noisy, you shouldn't be marching, you shouldn't be protesting, these are people that are trying to take away your right to redress your grievances. These are people that are trying to take away a weapon in your arsenal because protest is a weapon in your arsenal. All, all over the... I just, and and I, I'm not, I'm a student of history, so I, I, all over the world, people protest. The United States uh, actually applauds uh, some folks when they take to Tiananmen Square or when they take to other places around the country. They applaud that and they tell people how democracy is growing in these countries because there's some dissent and people are dissenting. And if they do something to the dissenters, then somehow they're a, a government that's tyrannical. And so here, when people begin to do those types of things, we look down upon it. And what's very interesting is the people who benefited from that kind of protest the most are the ones that allowed against people doing it again. That's right. That's right. And so they put people in these positions to make you say, oh, you shouldn't march, you shouldn't protest. They wanted me to speak out against those kids that were marching downtown uh, uh, at City Hall. And I, I would rather them be organized into groups like that and marching for, what, for, for rights and justice and, and, and democracy than be organized into, into, into groups uh, uh, that are killing each other and shooting each other on the streets that, that have no sense, that, that, that are not uh, organized around a, a particular goal. So our kids that are organized around something that says that they want education and they have the right to be educated and they have a right to define the way they are going to be educated is something that we should support, right? That's, that's, that's something that we should be a part of. Right? And that's, that you, you, you can never get me to say anything negative about that, even if people were marching against us or against me, right? People have the right to do that. 
and and you are to preserve people's right to be able to do those things. That's right. uh, so so that's important. But so my, my conversation is, how do we fix that? And one of the reporters said, uh, we see that you support the students. Does that mean in your administration there's going to be a lot of people marching and protesting? Well, that's kind of a ridiculous question, right? So, but the the question. So my answer is, I hope not, because hopefully we'll be doing the right thing. So. If, if we're doing the right thing, then maybe people wouldn't be marching and protesting. But if you put your hands over someone's mouth, they're going to scream louder. Mm -hmm. They're going to wiggle and move in order to get your hand away from their mouth so that they can scream. Right. But as long as your hand is there, they're always going to resist. If you want them to stop resisting, then you have to do what? Remove your hand from their mouth. And that's the point. So people want to be heard. They want to be listened to, and they want to be a part of the governing structure of their own lives. And that's why we say we become mayor uh, in the city of Newark, because we think that people should have a right to be a part of direct democracy, not just representative government, but direct democracy, to have a say-so in what's going on on their blocks, in their neighborhoods, with their school system, with jobs that come in, with economic development. They have a right to say what happens in their community and what does not happen in their community. And we need an astute, Right? We need an astute electoral body. We need an astute body of people that are, that are aware of the issues, that are engaged in what's going on every single day, that are a part of what's happening. So we need the population to be moving. Right? We need them to be moving. And we need you to be moving in the right direction. That's what we need. And that benefits us. It benefits me. It benefits the city that we get people to move progressively uh, in the right direction because we desperately need progressive politicians in this time period. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and I'm hopeful, right? So I think that this and many other victories that we have had glimpses of around the country is a testament that there is a progressive kind of movement that's about to happen in this country. The same group of people that organized themselves twice to put President Obama in office, right, twice, and then go away, needs to be the same group of people that organized themselves to have local elections, to be a part of local struggle, to be a part of statewide politics, because I'll come across some people when they say, listen, I only vote for the president. That's not, that's not right, right? So we have to get people involved in local elections, and city elections, and county elections, and state elections, they need to be involved. That same anti-racist democratic force that put Obama in office twice needs to be the same force that repeal this kind of right-wing tactics that are going on right here uh, uh, in this state and in this city. That same group of people. Uh, and, and, and that can happen over and over and over again. But we have to be committed to doing it. We have to be consistent like the folks here in the People's Organization of Progress. We have to be consistent and we have to be involved in this. So people say to us, the same way I uh, uphold people's right to protest and march, electoral politics is also another weapon in your arsenal. And if you don't understand that, then you're not clear. So some of us believe that we are more revolutionary because we're not involved in elections. That's actually backwards, right? So it's, it's actually backwards thinking because what's interesting to me is even when I was a child we always marched and we showed up at City Hall. We always march in the City Hall. And if you march in the City Hall, there must be something in there you're trying to get. At some point somebody's got to go inside of there. You know, ultimately that's, that's what needs to, we need to begin talking about how do we seize power. So if it's not about the seizure of power, then what you're talking about is really moot. So if you want to just yell, that's one thing. My father used to say that it's not enough to curse your enemies out. You actually have to fight them. You actually have to fight them. So it's not enough to just stand outside and call people a bunch of MFs. It's not enough to just go to the council meeting and curse everybody out, throw the mic down, and walk out with an applause. Right? That's not enough. Ultimately, you have to be talking about how do you seize power? 
How do you seize political power? How do you seize economic power? Yeah. How do you how do you make economic justice a reality? Uh, economic equality a reality in this country? How do you make social equality a reality in this country? Because look, we are 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education, right. and America is still probably one of the most segregated places in the in the world, right? So our school system. Our school system is the most segregated. There's two things that we're probably uh, uh, in the top three on around the world. One of them is poverty, the other one is segregation, right? So we, we're probably the most segregated, and New Jersey is probably one of the most segregated states. That's right, that's right. And, and the school system is extremely segregated. That's right. Uh, in fact, Rucker said that Newark Public Schools had double segregation. They call them apartheid schools, that's right? right. Where, where schools are not just segregated by race, but they're also segregated by class, by economy, by, by riches and wealth. So you have schools where there are 90% African American students and 90% poverty, right? See, th these are schools that our kids are in, that they're in like a factory almost. So 60 years later, we still are in the same boat after Brown 1, Brown 2, uh, 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 Charlotte and Mecklenburg, after all of the, the busing cases, Abbott. Uh, after Abbott, we're still in the same situation some 60 years later. So we obviously need a struggle, right. right? We obviously need to struggle and push back. And in all arenas, that's possible, we need to do that. And, and, and we need to do it loudly, right? And we need to do it on an electoral level, we need to do it on a, on a, on a, a community activist level. You know, we need to do it on all levels possible that's right. that's because right. we cannot continue to maintain the way things are and get things for our individual self right. while collectively we live in a situation that we all should be ashamed of. That's right. We should all be ashamed of the level of poverty that exists in this country. And, and if you want to just talk about Newark, in Newark specifically, we should be ashamed of the level of poverty that exists in this county. We should be ashamed of it. We, we should be ashamed of the level of segregation that exists here. We should be ashamed of all of the things, the way our, our school system is being attacked, shut down the way it is. We should be ashamed of that, right? right? And the fact that we don't say anything about it is a shameful thing. And when people say that you shouldn't say, say nothing or scream about it, then I think that that is an insane response to stimu stimuli. If a baby is hit, the baby cries out. If, if you hit a baby and it doesn't scream, then you take the baby to the doctor, right? Because now you're saying a baby got hit and it's not screaming, so it's not responding properly to stimulus, right? So if you're being oppressed or beaten and you're not screaming, then you're having an insane response to stimulus, right? You're having a, a response that's not normal. The normal thing to do is to say this is wrong, right? right? That's normal. And history has proven over years and decades that people have said and fought out. And our job is to carry that baton on. And the death of Maya Angelou, the death of Chokwe Lumumba, the death of my father, the, the death of many, uh, of, of Ilome Brath, the, the death of, of, of many says that there's much more work for us to do. So we can't just have these kind of historical meetings anymore where we get together and reminisce over the good times. Uh -huh. We can't get together and pass out the McDonald's calendar of all of the great heroes. <laughs> we, we, we actually have to begin to do the things that folks did that we talk about all of the time. Right. Some of we, we can't, some of us live still in 1968. We are in a different time. It is time for us to use present day tactics with present day young people and get folks involved in moving this thing forward and passing it and pushing and passing and pushing. Because if you stay in one place, you ultimately go backwards. Because science, I'm an educator, so I know science taught me that a body at rest remains at rest until acted upon by some force and vice versa, and that all things are really in motion, right? right. So at the end of the day, it's not going to stay still, it's going to go backwards, right? And if it begins to travel at a, at, a, at a rate or at a speed in one direction, it cannot be turned around until it's acted upon by an equal and opposite force. Mm -hmm. That's right, an equal. So you want to know why we're getting rolled over? 
because we're not operating in an equal and opposite force, right? So if we're operating in a dismantled force, a force that's uh, segmented, that you know that's disparate, that's all over the place, and we're and we're going forward, and there's a, a force. You saw that movie with Denzel Washington and the Runaway Train, right? And anything they put in its way, it just mold it down, right? And so if something is coming us coming at us with that velocity, right, and, and, and it gains that much power, then, then you know, the force of it, the, the sheer force of it is going to push us down until we organize ourselves in an equal and opposite force going in the opposite direction. That's right. You have to push it in the opposite direction. So it's two things that has to happen, which is the two things that are happening here in Newark. The first thing you do is you have to stop it from moving in, the, in this direction. That's the first thing you do. And the election was our opportunity to stop it from moving in this direction. Right? So it comes this way forcefully. We get in the way. The people stood in the way of the force and stopped it. But the more, the more important thing and the more difficult thing to do is to turn the force around to move it in the opposite direction. And that takes more power. It takes power to stop it, but it takes even more power to turn things in the opposite direction, right? It takes more uh, a skill, more analysis, more you know, all of us together to just turn this thing around and go in the opposite direction. And that's what we need to do now. So where do we go from here? This is what we have to do now. We have to turn it around, right? And push it in a direction that's beneficial to most people, to working people, to all people uh, in these communities. That's what we do. We push it in the opposite direction. And, and things are happening uh, for us or not for us because things have been going against us for a very long time. And I want to tell you that all of us have not been supportive of stopping that force. Mm. Because the train sometimes has stopped and picked some of us up. <laughs> right. And we get to look out the window at other people standing on the platform while it's driving in the direction opposite of everybody else. And then we get so confused, right? And so the people are so confused because they see people on the platform, on the train, and so the people are confused. They don't know what's what, who's who, what they should be doing, where they should be at, who should be yelling, who we should be organizing with. So they're confused. And so most some people just stay home. They don't want to be involved in this nonsense anymore, right? They just stay home or they, or they become cynical, right? And they say nothing is going to change or nothing is going to happen. Or and then there's some people who think they're doing the right thing and wind up doing the wrong thing because they're so confused about what's happening. They wind up doing the wrong thing. I think they're doing the people's will when they're doing individuals' will because they're confused about the situation that's going on. Because these people that we're fighting against is smart, right? So I was at a, a prayer visual upstairs on, on, uh, on yesterday or the day before, one of those days, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Reverend Simmons said, uh, when he was praying, he said that there is an enemy. And some of us don't seem to understand that. That there actually is a living enemy that we're not fighting each other or space or the air, that there's a living enemy, that there's people that benefit off of our demise, right? That benefit off of a military industrial complex, that benefit from a prison industrial complex, that benefit from chaos in public schools, that benefit from the fact that, they, that people don't have living wages, that benefit from the fact that everybody is not a part of some kind of organized union or in, in, in their job, that benefit from the fact that everybody don't get benefits when they go home, or they benefit from that fact. They, they get rich and they profit off of, off of the situation that we live in every single day. That there is a living enemy. Mm -hmm. That there are people who will, will spend, who tell you that they want school reform, and so as a result of them wanting school reform, they'll spend a million dollars in an election, but not a million dollars on public schools. <laughs> The most contradictory thing is somebody that would write an $800,000 check 
to slander somebody's name, to destroy public school, and say that they're for public schools when they could have just took the $800,000 check and wrote it to the public school system for after school programs, for extracurricular programs, for recreation for youth, for teacher training, for, for, for STEM programs, whatever it is you think that we need to improve public schools. And if you have $800,000 to spend in a week, you got a lot more where that comes from to invest in public schools in America to make sure that these schools are strong and our kids are learning all over the country. Right? So that by itself tells you that their motive is no good. That's what it tells you. It tells you that their motive is not good, that there's an enemy in that, right? So you're not investing in the kids, you're investing in something else. You invest, and so when you invest, you expect a return on your investment. And the question is, what is the return do you get off of that investment? What return do you get? And so what, what they get to do is use this money to confuse the people, to confuse us. To, to make you believe that up is down and down is up. That's what they make you believe uh, every single day. And they use the apparatus of the superstructure, the media, you know, uh, sometimes our religious leaders, all of these folks to confuse us about our condition, to tell you that it's not raining when you soaking wet. Right? And so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we always have to be clear. That's why we thank God for people like Larry Ham and organizations like this, where we always keep people astute, right? So people are clear, so you become clear on what's going on, so you can, you can even read lies and see the truth, right? You can read lies and see the truth in the lie. And, and, that's, and that's how we have to become. So we have a $93 million number close. We have a $93 million deficit in the city. And I told you all of the, the problems that exist uh, uh, in Newark. Um, and and what, what they want you to believe, finally, is that most of these cities are in a shape that they're in because they're incompetent yes. leaders that are running these cities, and they just don't know what to do. And you're waiting for somebody to show up that has uh, the competency <laughs> to run the city correctly. And so we've been looking for that person for a bunch of years. <laughs> And, and, they, and, and, they, and we've been looking for that person all over the country for a bunch of years to show up. And they never show up. And then we get angry and throw him out and get somebody else uh, because we don't understand that the problems that are happening in Newark also happen all over the country. So they happen in Newark and Cleveland and Chicago and New York. They happen everywhere. Right. And so that means that if, if, if those things are happening all over the country, that it's not just about individual leadership. It's about a systemic problem that exists in the country. That's, and, and so... so so if, 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 if there's been 50% or more of unemployment of African-American males in every and mostly every major city in America for the past five decades, then there's something wrong systematically with what's happening, right? right? So, so, so if public schools are not working, they don't work in, in your neighborhood, they work in other people's neighborhoods, not just in Newark, but all over the country, then you have to begin to think about what's happening in public schools in the inner cities in America all over the country, right? But yet you begin to see that when you see that poverty is pervasive, not just in Newark, not just in Newark South Ward, but all over the country. Everywhere you go in Chicago and Detroit and in East, in East Palo Alto, that there is deep levels of poverty, then there's something systemically wrong and it needs to be addressed. And until we link our struggles up and understand that, that these cities need an urban Marshall Plan. There you go. We need an urban Marshall Plan. So no, not just do we fight locally. And so the thing that they're most fearful of is not that we want to galvanize the people in Newark and, and, and motivate us to begin to take charge of our own lives and push back, but because we see similarities in our struggle and struggles all around the state and struggles all around the country. And then maybe you'll talk to somebody else and they'll also become clear and understand that we need investment, right? We need investment. We need infrastructure investment. We need roads to be built. We need schools to be built. We need highways to be repaired. We need things to happen. We need our water infrastructure to be uh, invested in. The third oldest city in this country. All these inner cities in America have old infrastructure. We need money invested. The same way they rebuilt Europe after World War II, we need to begin to rebuild these inner cities after uh, decades and decades of neglect 
of poverty, of economic deprivation in these communities. And, 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 and the country is not the, the, in the shape that it's in because of workers, it's in the shape that it's in because of bankers. And, and, that, and, and you just have to be clear on that. And, and if somebody, people is telling you that, then the people, you know, you become radical because you say the, the country didn't, Obama didn't bail out workers. He bailed out First National Bank. He bailed Bank, Bank of America. They got bailed. Bear Stern, these people got bailed out. Not you. They didn't bail you out your foreclosed home. They didn't bail you out of unemployment. They didn't bail you out of poverty. They didn't bail the schools out of deficits. They didn't bail these inner cities out of structural deficits that exist over year and year after year, they bailed out banks. Banks who gave themselves raises after they got bailed out. Banks that gave themselves, that made record profits after the bailout, they made record profits while people's wages remained the same. So if your wages remain the same for the fat past five or 10 years, that means that you actually lost money, not gained money. Because if your wages remain the same and the cost of living increases, That's your right. dollar is worth less. That That's means right. you are able to buy less with your money today than you were able to buy with your money five years ago. And when your wages don't increase, that means that you have less money in your pocket. Yeah. And if, if profits are increasing, that means productivity in America is increasing. Don't believe that it's not. Productivity in America is increasing. That means that workers are more efficient, they're working harder, but they're getting less for the work that they're doing, and owners are getting enormous amounts of profits from what's happening in this country. Because workers in America are work hard and always have worked hard for years. So I don't want you to be fooled by that. And so we have a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do and I need your help. Right? I need your help. I need you to continue to do what you've been doing, but I need you to step it up even more. We need more people to be a part of the organization. We need more people to show up to public meetings. We need more people to listen, to dissent, to speak out. Uh, we need more people to do that. And we don't just need you to do it in your own little circle. We need you to do it in a united front. We need you to organize with other organizations. We need you to be a part of what the labor unions are doing. We need you to be a part of what the PTAs are doing. We need you to be a part of what the people that are fighting against, uh, uh, fighting for more low-income housing are doing. We need you to be a part of a united front and show up. And yeah, fight for the things that are important to you. But we need you to link up with other people so we can build that equal and opposite force. That's what we need. And we don't need people that are running these cities that are quiet to the issues that the people are dealing with every single day. So we struggle to take care of people's lives as much as we possibly can, but we speak out against injustice. We speak out against injustice. And so they say they're not ready for your form of government. And I don't know what kind of form of government that means. That means they're not, afraid, they're not ready for democracy. They, people are not ready for democracy. Democracy is noisy. <laughs> it's messy. Yes, it is. Sometimes it's unruly. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, what we're doing now is nicer than what happened years ago. Mm -hmm. People used to duel each other in Congress. You know that, right? That's right. People, they shot each other. That's right. Bernie, That's right. They get paces, they had pistols in Congress and yeah. shot at each other. I mean, we're we we not bringing guns to the school board meeting. They beat each other on the floor. They, they beat, caned each other on the floor of Congress. Right. Caned each other. Right. I mean, so we at least progressed from that, right? I mean, the, the, the idea that you should be quiet is ridiculous. Say that. Say that. Say that. And all of us just have to play our part in this, right? We just have to do what we're supposed to do. And, and it, there's a lot of plans that we have for economic growth, for job creation, to make our schools better, to do all of these things that we need to do to, to build a, a, a beautiful and strong city, a community-led and run city. But the, 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 that can only happen with your help and your support. There's no one person that has magic beans in their pocket, right? Mm -hmm. There's no dust to sprinkle on everything and say everything mm -hmm. is gonna get better, right? Your job is not to vote and go home and watch SpongeBob, right? right? <laughs> Your job is to get out here and be involved in every place that you can be involved in. That's what we need you to do, right? There's a, uh, at our inauguration, July 1st, we want to show the state of New Jersey the level of support that we have 
in and around this city. So we're going to have our inauguration outside. All right. So, so you don't need a ticket. Just come. We, we, we are going to be in front of NJ Pack. It's a beautiful space. Let's use it for something beautiful, right. like transformation. Right. And so we're going to pile everybody outside of there. We told them we at least expect 5,000 people. I want you to make me a liar and bring more people than that. I mean, we want people from all over the country, from all over the state of New Jersey to take part in what has happened in the city of Newark. The day when the people stood up and said no to money and no to political bosses and political machines. When they said no, they said no. And everywhere I go in the state of New Jersey, people applaud. And they're not applauding me, they're applauding you. I know that. Because I didn't do this by myself, right? They're not giving you an applause. Every time they applaud me, I applaud the people of Newark, because it was the people of Newark that stood up. It's these seniors, when they saw all that mail that pulled me down and said, Baraka, keep your head up, I'm praying for you. Right. Seniors that been through difficult times, that saw God up close, right, in the middle of a rebellion, in the middle of Jim Crow, who said, we've been through worse times, baby. I'm praying for you, keep marching, keep pushing, you gonna win. You gonna win. And, and, and all of those young people, all of those young people that stood outside and held signs for hours and hours for free, that didn't get paid $150 or $200, that did it because they were trying to save their school, save their neighborhood, be involved. And the young people that I saw at the polls voting, people who I saw waiting in long lines, old students who waved to me as I walked in there and stood in that line, and stood there, or, or one of my uh, older students from Weekway who said, I moved back from Irvington to Newark so I could vote for you. And then when I went in there, when, when I went in there, they told me that you can't vote because you, you, your registration didn't come through. And she said, well, I need a provisional ballot. And they, they don't expect young people to know that. And, and my friend Kaburi said those are the people they didn't poll, right? They didn't poll them people. They didn't have no phone. They didn't, have, they, they didn't poll. They didn't call their cell phone. They called them home phones. They got cell phones, right? They on Facebook. They didn't poll the 21-year-old kid that's there and standing on a block on Bergen Street that when I walk by said, B-Rock, I got you. I'm going to the polls today. They didn't poll those people. They didn't poll the downtrodden, the depressed, the voiceless, the hopeless, the people they talked about in the, the debate, the people they accused of being gangbangers, the poor, the, the chronically unemployed, the people looking for housing, the people looking for jobs, the people looking for work, the people looking for help every single day who saw an opportunity, who saw the opportunity to have hope, to have faith, to say we're going to take our city back and by God I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to be a part of it. And, 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 and the most beautiful thing of it all, the day after the election, I stood in front of King's Restaurant and, and Channel 11 and Channel 7 and Channel 4 and Channel 2 and the Star Ledger and all of them standing out there trying to do an interview. And the bus pulled up and the back of the bus opened and a young boy, about 18, opened up the bus and said, I am the mayor. That's what he said. He said, I am the mayor. And in no time in history, that he ever could say that. Never thought he could be the mayor at 18 years old with his white t-shirt on and his baggy jeans on his pants and his boots to yell off the bus and say, I am the mayor too. That's the kind of hope that our people need and that's, the, and that's why they're afraid of what we're doing in the city of Newark because once we give these young people hope and we give them direction and we give them information, then the meetings we have will be filled, overflowed, and they will be young like Larry Ham was when he participated in struggle back in the 60s and 70s. And they begin to take power in this city, and they won't need Raz Baraka anymore because they're going to have themselves to do the things that they need to do every single day in this city. God bless you. God speed. God be with you.
everybody there when July 1st. When? 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 We're going to send a message to the governor on July 1st. Give the mayor, Ross Baraka, another big hand. Give him another big hand. He is a history maker. He's bringing progressive politics, raising it to a new level in Newark, New Jersey. I can't remember, I'm old enough to have seen, let's see, how many mayors have I seen in Newark? Four? Four mayors? None of them gave a speech that, like the speech that was given here today. None of them gave a speech like that. We got a mayor that can be the chief administrator of the city, but we got a mayor that has an activist message. And he talked tonight about organizing and mobilizing, and this is what we're going to do. He talked about the United Front, and I have pledged tonight that the People's Organization for Progress, we will work more vigorously to build closer relations with other organizations. This has been our practice, but we're going to raise it to a higher level. Raz Baraka talked about the importance of protest tonight. We're going to rock this city for the next four years. We're going to rock it. You think, you think 381 days was something. Just wait. We're going to make Newark once again the hub of the liberation movement in the United States of America. I hope everyone realizes what a historical juncture we are at now. I see Ras Baraka speaking tonight, and I could not help but reflect upon the fact that today is the birthday of Maurice Bishop. How many of you remember Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel Movement? Maurice Bishop led the New Jewel Movement, which was the liberation movement in Grenada. And it was the first time that a socialist government was established in an English-speaking Caribbean nation. The New Jewel Movement and Maurice Bishop was so powerful that the forces of US imperialism had to move and had to stop and had to destroy the New Jewel Movement. And they assassinated Maurice Bishop because he was trying to build a progressive and revolutionary government in Grenada. But you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. Revolutionary ideas cannot be stopped. And when a revolutionary force, a revolutionary spirit seizes upon people, then they become a force, a historical force, that cannot be stopped. Ras Baraka talked tonight about the need for systemic transformation. That we have to work not only on the day-to-day -day problems that people face, but in fact change the institutions and the systems that create those problems. I cannot remember whenever I've heard anyone in any elected office in Newark talk like that. <laughs> so I realize that we are at a historical movement. And I see this room filled tonight, and I think to myself, if we could only keep these folks together and work together to build the kind of movement that Ross was talking about, we would make a model for the nation, brothers and sisters. A model for the nation. So I'm so glad that the mayor-elect was able to spend a considerable amount of time with us tonight and really speak his mind on what needs to be done. But we have another great speaker tonight. We have a double header for you tonight. And I hope that at the conclusion of this great program tonight, 
that many of you who are here for the first time will grasp the message that the mayor-elect gave about becoming more involved. And I would hope that those of you who are here tonight for the first time will consider joining the People's Organization for Progress because we are and have been for 33 years dedicated to building the type of movement that Mary Leck Baraka was talking about tonight. And I know a number of you are new members. How many new members we have here tonight? Raise your hands, new members. Stand up, give the new members of the People's Organization for Progress, give them a big hand. We're so glad to see. And we extend the hand of friendship and we're ready to work together on that. So I hope before you leave tonight, you'll get a membership form. The membership forms are there on the table. Sign the membership form. That automatically makes you a supporting member of the People's Organization for Progress. And you remain a supporting member until you tell us you don't want to be a member no more. Not like you got to renew every year. But then those of you who are supporting members, I hope you will become dues paying members. <laughs> It's good to be a supporting member. It's even better to be a dues-paying member. Because when you're a dues-paying member, you can vote and help shape the policies of the organization. We need a mass organization that's dedicated to revolutionary transformation to build a mass movement that can bring about revolutionary transformation. I don't use that word lightly, brothers and sisters. This is a time for revolution. When I met Ras Baraka's father when I was 17, I believed then that we needed a revolution. 43 years later, I'm 60 years old, I still believe that we need a revolution here in the United States of America. So now I'd like to bring forward the brother who was scheduled a month ago to be here tonight. And I'm so glad that he chose to come tonight, even though the mayor was going to be here. That didn't deter him. He is a brother with whom you are familiar. And he has dedicated himself to the cause of education for liberation. He is not just nationally renowned, but internationally renowned for his work in the field of education. And he's homegrown right here from Essex County our brother, educator Baruti Kafeli. Give him a big hand. And he's going to talk tonight on making urban schools work. I'm an educator, and I'm going to talk education for a few minutes. But there's one reason, and one reason only, that if I was on that side of the room and the question was asked, did I know Maurice Bishop, there's only one reason my hand would have gone up. And that reason is because my home away from home throughout the 80s and the 90s was on Lenox Avenue, known as Malcolm X Boulevard, in a small structure named Liberation Bookstore. And I lived in that store. I didn't have the money to buy all the books I bought, but I made sure that I got it somewhere. And I educated myself. And through educating myself, there were certain things that I just couldn't do anymore. And there were certain things that I just must know. And because I must know them, there are certain other things that I just must commit myself to and do. Yeah. So when we look at schools, for those of you that don't know me or know anything about me, let me tell you a little bit about what I do right now. And we'll kind of backtrack and talk about what I used to do. Right now, I'm a, I'm a young man that lives out of a garment bag, literally. I'm in about three to five states per week, wow. per week. That means I could be in anywhere from three to four time zones per week. Or I could be international and then there's more time zones. And I live in the bag because I work in school districts and I'm literally transforming schools all over America. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't have done it or I couldn't do it had I not made those trips to Liberation Bookstore. Yes. 
See, Liberation Bookstore is what did it for me. When I was in high school at East Orange High School and subsequently Woodbridge High School, that didn't do it for me. I didn't understand why I had to go every day, so I didn't go and graduated with a 1.5 GPA. I walked the streets for the next five years and then enrolled at Kane University in 1984 after having walked around for five years. So had nothing, but went on in there and stumbled on Malcolm literally the first day I got there. Wow. So by studying or stumbling on Malcolm the first day I got there, it made that academic coursework quite easy. Because on studying Malcolm, I learned a lot about myself. Yes. Because in studying Malcolm, I learned history. Yes. I learned Maurice Bishop. Yes. I learned the New Jewel Movement. Yes. So as a result of studying so much history, I came out of there in two years at summa cum laude. So, but I'm not saying that to bring attention to myself. I'm saying that to bring attention to young people. See, in this life I live, I'm in literally hundreds of schools throughout the course of the year. I'm in schools in about 40 different states throughout the year for the past three years. Mm -hmm. I talk to tens of thousands of educators in terms of workshops and presentations. I interact with thousands of educators. And I want to tell you, as I stood there, I listened to Rat Mayor, I don't want to call him Raz, I listened to Mayor Barack, Mayor Elect, and he talked about the systemic problems across the country. And I agree wholeheartedly. But as I stood there, and as I asked myself the same question every day about systemic problems, I'm asking myself as I'm standing there, Principal Kefele, what can you do to impact those problems that he just outlined. Mm -hmm. And pretty much I come to the conclusion as an individual, probably nothing. But collectively, as he said, there's a whole lot we could do. But while we're doing that collectively, there's some things as an individual that you and I have to continue to do. So I made a decision. Let me go to what I used to do now to kind of bring this together. I was a principal in East Orange, Plainfield, and Essex County for 14 years. They tell me that I did some good things. I'll, I'll take that. But within that, I wasn't independent. I wasn't autonomous. I had to answer to somebody for the 14 years. So although I knew the answers, Although I knew how to fix this mess, I'm convinced of that, I still had to answer to my bosses. So I made a decision in 2011, despite the accomplishments that I made as a principal for 14 years. I said, I'm going to step out of that, and I'm going to be America's principal. How about that? Now, for those that don't know me, the question is, what does he mean by that? And I said, I can't be tied to a system in order to fix it any longer. I got to be outside of it, but I got to figure out a way to get back in it, but as an independent consultant. And if I could be unattached, unaffiliated, but yet inside doing the work, then I can effectuate enormous change in the lives of our children. Because see again, Mayor, Raz, Mayor Baraka spoke a lot about North, but let me tell you what I see across the country in approximately 40 states. I see, I see a lot of phenomenal teachers. Let me, let me be positive first, because I like to keep it positive. I see a lot of phenomenal educators, whether they be building administrators, teachers, central office, and I see a lot of phenomenal and high-performing children. But now that I got that out the way, let me go to what I really see. Mm -hmm. I see a whole lot of our children, starting with kindergarten, who have been written off in mass. Wow. I'm going to say it again. 
I see a whole lot of our children, starting in kindergarten, who have been written off in mass. I see a whole lot of teachers who tell me, Principal Kefele, I don't know what to do with these kids. But what grade do you teach, Miss So-and-so? What grade do you teach, Mr. So-and-so? I teach grade one. I teach grade two. I teach grade three. And you telling me that you can't control them? You telling me that you can't educate them? You telling me that you can't inspire them? Principal Kefela, I don't know what to do. And let me be crystal clear, I'm not talking about white teachers. I'm talking about anybody who comes to me and says, I don't know what to do. Well, see, when I come to these schools, I'm clear on what to do. When I was a principal in Plainfield, I fought that superintendent so much, I was in them papers down there 21 times in one year because I had devised a comprehensive reform model for urban schools. See, we talk about reform, core curriculum, charter schools, and all these other reforms. But one of the things we don't talk about is the program within the reform. So I put together a comprehensive reform model, which I won't bore you with all the details, but I'm going to tell you some summaries. But I couldn't institute that in Plainfield, so I said, well, I'm out of here. And I went on back to East Orange and got into another war with another superintendent. Some of you are probably familiar because I was on KISS all the time and Channel 9 all the time when they were running me out of town. So didn't get to implement it there. But then when I got to North Tech, when I met the superintendent who interviewed me since I was recruited, I told him, you got to let me run this or I don't have to be here. So he said, go ahead and run the school. So went on and ran the school, and we got the results. But in the meantime, no need for the full comprehens comprehensive program. But when I took to the road and started introducing this to schools, then I'm able to look back and see schools literally transform. So now, in those particular schools, I don't have to look at a kindergarten, a first grader a second and third grader who are so many grades behind. Don't have to look at a middle school age student coming in at the third grade reading level. Don't have to look at a high school student making decisions to drop out of school or whatever the case may be. Because the reform model touches everybody. But see, once again, systemic change. Principal Kefele can't change that single-handed. But I understand that if we go into a school with the right model, speaking the right language, with the right intentions, yes. with the right kind of leadership, yes. and the right kind of teachers who are getting the job done, I'm telling you, I don't care if a kid is coming from poverty. I don't care what his home life is. I don't care what the neighborhood life is. I'm telling you, that an oasis can be created within that building. So in the city of Newark, for example, don't tell me about poverty. I run away from those conversations every time I hear them. I say to teachers all the time, I say to principals all the time, you knew that poverty existed before you interviewed for the job. <laughs> so when you get there, don't tell me that now you can't do it because of poverty. Because if you're, if, if, if you're in that classroom, then you got to have the mindset, you got to have the attitude that these students are going to soar because I am their teacher. Right. If you're the principal, then the mindset is these students are going to soar because I am your leader. And if you can't carry that mindset, then you're in the wrong profession. You don't belong there. It's that simple. So. With that said, I'm going to take a risk and bore you with some jargon, but I, but I, I want to give it to you. And then I'm going to open up the floor, and then we, we, my portion is going to be done. 
Here's what I'm saying in a nutshell in terms of that reform model. I'm saying that number one, that model is comprised of school leadership. That's important. So when we talk about school leader, with leadership, we're talking about that leader being that instructional leader of that school, that inspirational leader of that school, that informational leader of that school. How dare we have a school in an inner city of black and Latino children, for example, and staff members do not know that Dr. Ben was born. Wow. Staff members do not know that Dr. Clark was born. Staff members do not know that Chancellor Williams, Chuck Antadia, et cetera, were born. See, as leader, and I'm not talking about in a charter school, I'm talking about in whatever school. I needed my staff to know that these individuals were born. I needed my staff to know that Carter G. Woodson was born. I needed my staff to understand that when Carter G. Woodson said, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or over yonder. He will find his proper place and he will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he'll cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. I needed my staff to understand that. And see, as I said, because somebody in this room is thinking, but come on, Kefele, how you going to pull that off? But see, if I got principles that I'm training that know nothing about that, then I got to enlighten them. I got to make them understand. Because you could beat a kid down with reading, math, and writing all you want. That's not going to make them smarter. That's not even going to raise test scores. I found that out the hard way. But if on the other hand, you understand how to inspire, bring it out of a kid so he or she wants it, now you increase the probability that that kid is going to soar. Right. So what better way to inspire the young man, to inspire the young lady, than to teach him and her who you are? Right. So that you recognize who that is in your mirror. That's right. But I told you about 10 minutes ago, I had to break camp from being on the inside, but figure out how to get back on the inside while being free. So imagine being on the inside a free man, unbought, unbossed, and able to tell folks that your children in your school need to know who that is in their mirror when they look in it. See, so now the principal is saying, well, well wait a minute, what, what do you mean? I'm saying you got a school full of youngsters who were born brilliant, That's right. That's right. who were born That's right. most highly capable, That's right. but you didn't tell them. Yeah. That's right. So because you didn't tell them, you see the manifestations that you see. That's right. That's right. But imagine you put them in a climate and a culture, a mood and a lifestyle, where they can feel great about themselves. So let's say there were some skeptics in this room. I can tell you with, with, with supreme confidence, family, that it's doable because I'm living it. See, I'm living it. I'm in these schools and I'm training these folks. I'm training them on how to connect with black and Latino children. But in order for me to go in there with authority to say that this is how you do it, I got to demonstrate that I already did it. So if I've already done it, now I got credibility to go into the school and say, this is how it's done. So I said I won't bore you with jargon, but let me, let me, let me give you this. School leadership. But then I said there's, there's, five, there's five broad strands to this reform model. Number two, school branding. 
let me let me let me pose a test right now. I challenge anybody in this room, and I mean you can go to the best schools in North tomorrow. I challenge you. Go inside that school tomorrow. Find five teachers. Ask all five separately, or I shouldn't say teachers, staff members, whomever. Mm -hmm. Ask the five separately. As a school, who are you? I can guarantee you that you will get five different responses. Uh -huh. That is a major problem. See, we look at systematically what we got to do. But then when I narrow this down to on a micro level, and I'm looking at a school, a singular school, and I say, school X, Y, Z, who are you? Nobody in the school knows. <laughs> because each staff member has an opinion of who we are. But the opinion of who we are is not our identity. That's just our opinion of who we are as a school. So now Jalil, which is my generic name, Jalil is going to go into that building tomorrow morning. And Jalil is going to go into a school which has an identity crisis. It is a school that is dysfunctional relative to who it is, its very identity, so therefore the foundation upon which it stands. And yet, we're going to expect Jalil to be able to navigate throughout that building for the entire day, whereas he goes from class to class and teacher to teacher, there's no consistency right. nor continuity as to who we are right. as a school. So within the reform model that I put together, we spend an enormous amount of time determining, well, what is our identity? See, if I were to draw on this wall or put a poster on this wall of two golden arches, <laughs> there's nobody in this room who will question, what is that? Because millions and over the years, billions of dollars have been spent to ensure that you recognize the golden arches. It is the identity of the restaurant and no name is needed. In fact, no menu is needed. All you need to do is walk in there and as long as there's someone to serve you, you know what you want because you know the brand of the school, well, of, the, of the restaurant. Well, what about the brand of the school? How does that school advance if it has not determined who it is? How does it advance if it has not determined its identity. The name on the building is not good enough. It's got to be a commonality and consistency relative to who it is and what it is, what it's about, where it's going. So what is its mission? I need to be able to gauge that as soon as I walk in the front lobby. What is its vision? What is its purpose? And how do we implement in order to ensure that young people are striving? So, I'm saying all that to say in a very summarized form, the brand of the school matters. Then the school climate and culture. When I say school climate, I'm saying the mood of that school. What does one feel when they walk in there? And I'm saying that whatever one feels, that's an intentionality that has to be put in place by every staff member in that building. But if one walks into a building and there's been no intentionality, behind creating a mood which is conducive for Jalil to have the willingness to strive for excellence, uh. then chances are Jalil is going to be a failure mm -hmm. because of the lack of intentionality on creating that mood. But then what about the culture of that school? What is the lifestyle of that school? And is it a culture of excellence or is it a culture of mediocrity and failure? But there's got to be an intentionality behind creating it. So I'm saying all that. And let me, let me give you the last two. And then parental and community engagement, which is key. Because no school can operate in a vacuum, on, a, on an island unto itself. And then finally, young men's and young women's empowerment. A program within the school that literally teaches boys what it is to be a man and teaches young ladies what it is to be a woman.
Now, someone might have the question, but where are you going to find the people to do that? You go into the city of Newark, and you tap into every brother, every sister in the city, and they become partners of the school. When I look at the schools I, uh, th that I was a principal of, particularly uh, North Tech, the highlight of my week, every week, was Monday, when it was required that you walk in that building in a shirt and tie, slack shoes, and a belt to hold your pants up. And then bringing in so many brothers, and probably some sitting in this room right now, who came to the school to talk manhood with my boys. That was an inherent part of the program. Yes. And I could stand here and say, if that part of the program had not existed, I don't know that that school would have done what it had done at that time. But it was an, a very important aspect of the total program that young men's, that young women's empowerment program. So within that young men's and young women, now we're going right to that history. Now, if, if it's not being taught in the classroom, we're teaching it right in that cafeteria, that auditorium, that gymnasium. That's right. That's right. Making sure that they recognize who they are. Because see, I can't have a school full of Jalils who look in the mirror and see the N-word looking back at it. Because wow. see, what I taught, what I taught, you can't be a black man and an N-word simultaneously. What I taught, you have to make a decision as to which one you're going to be. So we help them make the decision that I'm going to be a man in the truest sense of what a man is. So with all that said, this is what I do. This is what I do for a living. But I was, as I always say, being an educator is not my job. I'm unemployed. It's not my mission. It's not my, it's not my profession. It's not my career, but it's my mission. So waking up to one's mission every day, working with educators by way of children to increase the probability that young people are in fact achieving at the highest possible levels. So as I close and open up the floor, if there's any questions, there's no way in the world that I could look at Jalil, that I could look at Jamela my generic name for young lady, and see failure in them. I got to see them not for who they are right now, but for what they will become That's 10, right. 20 years from now. That's right. You and I got to see greatness within them. Got to see extraordinary accomplishment within them. And as long as that teacher, whomever that teacher is, as long as that principal, whomever that principal is, sees greatness, in Jalil and Jamela on a daily basis. Sees extraordinary in, in Jalil and Jamela. Sees those two young people achieving at the highest levels because I am your teacher, because I am your leader. Then I'm saying to you, it's gonna happen. Now let me, let me plug something real quick and then I'm gonna open up the floor. <clears throat> Some of you in this room, you know I plug this thing every day, but I'm gonna plug it in here too. I started, I, I got one day in November, I'm sitting in, my, in a rental car somewhere. And I said to myself, I got to do more. I'm not doing enough. Now I'm never home. I never see my family. But I'm saying to myself, I got to do more. So I started making these videos, these selfies. Everybody talking about selfies. I said, let me get in on this selfie craze. But let me make it work. So I started making these videos called Message to Your Son. And some of you in the room know I started going crazy with them things. I was posting one literally every day, just a short three to six minute video where I talk to a young man and say, here's what you need to do to be successful. So every day I'm putting a new one on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and saying, here's another, here's another way to look at what I said yesterday. Here's what you need to do to get it done. And what I found, folks were watching them videos every day. So I, so I, kept, I kept on going. So I stopped at 130. So between November and March, or what, February, whatever it was, the end of February, 
made 130 of these videos, got 50 more sitting on the computer, which I'll put out in September when school reopens for the country. And I'm saying this to you as I plug it, boys are watching. Because they're sending me emails, they're sending me tweets every day. They're saying it's the best message I hear which is what kept me making these videos, because it's crazy. I'm standing anywhere. You see the background, some of you. It's people walking by. I get out my car, pull the laptop out, don't care who's looking, start talking to the computer. Because as I'm talking to the computer, I'm literally in my mind, I'm seeing millions of young men in my mind as I'm speaking. So now they get on and they start watching. It's a principal in the room sitting right here, one of my buddies, Principal Stallings, and me, Starnes. He plays them over the PA system every day. Wow. So the whole school here, put your hand up for me. But he's not the only one doing it. It's principals across the country bringing the kids to the auditorium and having them sit down and watch the message. So I'm saying that to say this on the one hand as I close, I'm, I'm plugging that. There's no money for me to be made because they're on YouTube. But on the other hand, I'm saying as, 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 as a teacher in this capacity, as I sat down in that car and said, I got to do more, and here's one of the things I will do. Well, I'm saying to all of us in the room, and I'm talking to myself in the process, let's all look within and say, what more can I do? And I know it's folks in this room, because I, I follow you on Facebook. You, 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 you doing a heck of a lot. I know that already. But then look within and say, what more can I do to effectuate change in the lives of some youngster? What more can I do? So as I continue to ask myself that question, I went on and did the same thing with them selfies and created a channel for teachers. So Principal Kefele's message to educators, so there's about 30 of them up now. Then I said, what more can I do? So I created a channel for parents. So now a bunch of selfie videos for parents. But Principal Kefele, what more can I do? So then created a channel for the youth, including the girls. But then what more can I do? Created another channel for aspiring principals. You got so many people that want to lead and don't know what to do when they get in there. So I said, let me create a channel of about 30 videos showing folks who want to lead. And then the ones that already lead, they can look at it too and say, here's some things you need to think about right now in order to become effective school leader. But then I said, what more can I do? So I'm in the process now writing that next book, my seventh book, for aspiring principals to put it on paper to say, you want to lead? Well, here's some things you need to think about. But it keeps going, family. What more can I do? And we just keep asking ourselves that question, never reaching a level of fatigue where we can't go any further. Just what more can I do? And, and, and I'm going to close. When you do it, do it within your lane. Because I get asked a lot of times to step outside of my lane. I can't tell you how many times since, getting ready to say Raz again, since Mayor elect Barack. I can't tell you how many times since he was elected the folks are sending me emails talking about, about, about me becoming the superintendent in North. And as I tell them all the time, and some of you in this room, you already know I use this language, it ain't my lane. See, I know my lane, I know my place. So I'm saying to us, whatever you do that's that much more, do it within your lane so that you can be maximally effective. Because when we step out of our lane and try to do somebody else's calling, right. then a lot of times we're not as effective as we would like to be because it's not your calling in the first place. You're out of your lane. Right. So I know my lane. I stay in my lane. And that way, I increase the probability for my effectiveness within it. With that, I close. Principal, the family will take some questions now. Sister, Sister Natasha. Peace, family. Peace. Peace.
It's an honor to hear you speak once again. I have a quick suggestion. I have a question, but my suggestion, because you said that you were going to release the um, messages in September, how about in the summer when things are crucial for our young men? That's just my suggestion. I, I, I would start to And um, but my question is, um, in terms of you being able to go into schools, you know, transforming schools and things like that, um, the reception between maybe local controlled schools and, and um, state state controlled schools, like what's the reception and the percentage and things like that? Outside of New Jersey, I don't run into state controlled schools, right? I mean. If, if if they if they exist, the, the 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 question was the reception between school districts that are state run versus those that are not, and I'm saying that outside of New Jersey, this this is really a New Jersey thing. When you when you talk about state run school districts, there there could be a smattering somewhere, but I mean when you talk about North Jersey City, Camden, Patterson, that's that's an aberration. That's that's not normal. Now Detroit got some interesting things, or Michigan with emergency management and all that kind of thing. But this thing that you see in, in New Jersey, this this is not this is not normal. The, the, the quote rags from uh, yeah, it, it's pretty abnormal. And and the the other comment you made about the uh, releasing those other vids, I called myself allowing folks to catch up on the, because there's 130 of them, and and yeah, so that's what I'm letting people do. Appreciate it. Please. Yes, sir. My question is around the Amistad bill. You go, you go around the country with a message to me is similar to what a law that we have here in our state, in New Jersey. And how are the other states able to, to receive your message in terms of implementing what you're, what you're stressing to teachers is is the importance of our young children knowing their history. Right. We're here in New Jersey, we have a law that says that the school system, the New Jersey public school system, should be teaching African American and Latino American children their history, not just in doing Black History Month, but in all the curriculum, from math to science to mathematics and all the curriculums, there should be a point in where their history should be taught. And actually we have you sit right here. the legislature who wrote the legislation. So how can in New Jersey, you know, you can press forward for that to actually happen in our school system? You know, I thought about Okay, sorry. The question the question was with the Amistad bill, the Amistad law. It's been in place since I think two thousand and one. It's been law, but there's no district in New Jersey that has implemented this law. Now, there are individual teachers who happen to be conscious, who are doing, what, doing the right thing relative to Amistad, but they're doing that in spite of Amistad because they just, they're just bringing that kind of consciousness to their classroom. But in terms of implementation of I've been saying it for years since 2001. We can make we can make that happen, you know. So it's going back to everything I heard Mayor Lech Baraka say about systemic change. When I look at those of you in the room who are my Facebook friends, you know that every everything that I've that I've seen published about the North Student Union, those students, I've been posting, I've been sharing because I want people to read that. I want people to see the stance that these young people have taken, despite whatever adults it's been said are working with them, but. As I saw that, I'm thinking to myself, I wish they had Amistad on their agenda. See, so, so if, I'm a, if I'm a tie up a board meeting, if I'm going to stop a board meeting, imagine if a part of my platform, and I don't know that this is their part of their platform, I don't know, but imagine these young people and a part of their platform is that we want to see this law being implemented. We're not asking you to do anything out of the ordinary, it's law. We just want to see it implemented. I believe that they stand a better chance of success because they're young people. But it's got to be put on their agenda. Yeah, you go ahead. This is Assemblyman Bill Payne. He's the author of the Amistad Bill. Give him a hand. You know, let him say a word. 
Just one word. I, I think what's important for all of us, we talked about act, becoming active and more active, et cetera. This is a law of the state of New Jersey. It's a law. And every single school district in the state of New Jersey is supposed to be implementing it. And there's about 550 to 600 different school districts. Well, every single uh, department, Board of Education has a meeting, maybe a monthly meeting, et cetera. And during that meeting, there's a, a part of the, the public can get up and have something to say. And all we need to do as every one of these is to attend these meetings and at the time when the public is given the opportunity to speak, we insist, we ask that body, why aren't you following the law? We insist that you teach it in Plainfield or in Wildwood or wherever you are. We can make that happen because they are violating the law. But as long as we're quiet about it, they're not going to do it. It's there, and if in fact they don't teach it, then we can bring legal action. But it's a law on the books, and we as citizens can go to a Board of Education meeting and say, the state of New Jersey requires you to do this, and we insist that you do it. And that would be one way of, of getting it in place. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. You see, and, and, and let, me, let me just add, and I got you. I'm going to go back to Principal Stalin's standing. He's all, he moved now. Amistad's being instituted at Sojourner Truth Middle School in East Orange. Right? See, I'm known to say leadership matters. Leadership is everything, whether it be a school, any organization, this organization, yes. pop, leadership, yes. leadership matters. So you put strong leadership in place, whether it be a school, a, a, an organization, a company, a business, whatever the case may be, leadership is everything. And when you got strong leadership, then all those programs that need to be in place or whatever that direction is necessary within the organization is there because the rudder, which is the leader, is in place. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I'm a business owner. I have an insurance and financial corporation and also a health business. Um, corporation. So I also work with the uh, local government as well as other private and public organizations. So uh, what we're currently doing is uh, not just telling young people what they need to be educated in and just giving them information. It's very important that young people have career skills and that there are also uh, uh, avenues put in place where young people can get jobs, employment, because at the end of the day, if they have all of this information and all of this knowledge, and they're, at the end of the day, there's no recourse for them to get employment, build careers, and ultimately to sustain their lives, then uh, unfortunately they will default back to um, areas of which we're trying to prevent in the first place. So um, my question is, how do uh, we get more involved with rolling up our sleeves, getting young people uh, skills training, especially in an, uh, in an economic environment where it's not possible economically for many young children or most young children to get a college education. And so there's an opportunity to provide career skills and avenues of where children can then uh, uh, go into higher education and then ultimately provide some sort of stability or skill that will allow them to elevate and grow in other career uh, avenues. So ultimately, my thing is we know what the problems are, but let's focus on some solutions. Skill training and getting uh, young people jobs and connecting private and public entities to ch uh, children, young people who have ready to work skills so that they can see ultimately what the light at the end of the tunnel is for them. Right. See, <laughs> someone, let me, let, me, let me use you as my example in, in terms of the answer. The, 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 summar, the summarize the question, it, it was it was just how do we how do we get skill, skill job training skills training but not, excuse me, not how we do it we can do it how do we get the young people the information and the skills that they need to
what measures and support are in place to bring it to the table and get to work? Because we already know what the problems are. See, see the bottom, the bottom, what, what, what you're asking almost goes beyond the capacity of a school in terms of providing that training. But going back to that young men's and young women's empowerment, when those young people are exposed to someone like yourself, who's an entrepreneur, right? And your question, 99% of it was, was dealing with the training. How, how, how do we get them there, right? But see, here, here, here's where how I would use your services. If I were the principal of the school, and I went to you and I said, I want you to come in and talk to my children about that very question. I want to be in position, because this is part of what we did. I want to take them to your place of employment. That's right. I, want, I want them to see you working. See, I may not be able to, with being, being the principal and being the school, I may not be able to, ch chances are excellent. I'm not going to be able to provide the job. That's not even my role. My, my, my role is to get them ready for it. But, but see, with you, now I partner with the community and, and, and yourself. Now I got you, and now I got you to come into the school and, and just your presence as a model for them. So now here you are, and you're not asking me for, for a dime to do it. Just your presence. There's some, sister, some young lady who just seeing you is going to connect with you and say, I want to be like you. So see, now I may not be able to provide the job, but I can provide the inspiration to get the job or the skill because you're in the building. And I'm only using you as an example. I can say everybody in this room, but you're there. But let me take it a step further. When I say 99% of what you said was the, the skill in the job. Here's what I meant by that. You're an entrepreneur. I want to plant that seed more than I want to plant that job seed. See, I don't even want to have the conversation about the job with them. I want to talk about you owning your own business. Said differently. I want to talk to them about living life on your Terms. See, so now you're coming in and saying, look, and this is without you bragging and boasting, you're just talking. I'm an entrepreneur, and here's what I did. I had gone through the same challenges that you did, the same trials, the same tribulations that you did, but here's what I did, and I had to maintain a certain attitude in order for it to happen. See, and now as you and I instill that, and the mindset is changing, all that skill stuff, that will take care of itself. What, what, what I want to do is make Jalil hungry. Because see, he's coming to me not demonstrating his hunger. He may be coming to me mad. He may be coming to me hungry, but looking for a quick fix to satisfy his hunger and not willing to crawl. So, I would just like to just say this for every person in this room that has the economic development is where the power is and that for each person in this room is my area of expertise is health insurance and uh, and finance every person in this room deposits their money into a bank they go to a health services facility they utilize insurance services whatever it may be ultimately how do people within the community exercise their economic power by making a concerted effort to say, this is where we're going to invest our resources, where young people are being entrepreneurs, where young people are getting the skills and the training so that they can also support those young people's businesses instead of taking their dollars and supporting them in places that's not circulating within their community. I'm, I'm with you. So for businesses to be successful and entrepreneurs of young people, you have to have the support of the community 
going into those young people's businesses and saying, you know what, it may not be as big and brand and name brand as ABC company down the street, right. but I'm supporting a business that's investing back in me and in my community. Absolutely. So that mindset has to be there also, as, and even as we think about Black Wall Street. Yeah, absolutely. L l last point on that. Let me go back to Brother Sheree. See, everything that we just said in this, this exchange, yes. if history and culture are absent from the conversation, then it's almost for naught. Because see, everything we just said, now I got to bring Garvey into the conversation. See, so because what you just, the, the, the last part of what you said will make sense to him when he sees or she sees that it's already been done. See, Garvey already laid this thing out. Honorable Elijah Muhammad already laid this thing out. See, so I just got to enlighten him and her to the fact that we ain't talking about nothing new here. We're talking about stuff that's a part of you in your mirror. Let me introduce you to these people who now I expect you to pick up the torch and, 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 and carry out what you just said, but let me give them historical context so that they understand what it is that they should be doing. See, let me, let me, let, I'm gonna go right, right here. Let me just say this one thing. The only reason, matter of fact, hear me well, folks. I'm like, I'm like home right now, and I, and, and I almost don't know what to do with it. And, 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 and let, me, let me explain that to you. These kind of presentations, I don't do them anymore. I don't get these kind of invites. I do staff development. That's what I do. When I do staff development, hear me well, and, and hear me well so you don't misconstrue, particularly with these cameras rolling. <laughs> Black children. Ex with the exception of the Deep South, black children in schools that are predominantly black, 99, 100%, their teachers in K-5 to are white women. That's who their teachers are. That's not, that's not theory for me. This is what I know. I get to see it every day, right? So when I walk into that environment, Ain't nobody loving the fact that Kefele's coming initially. Yes. Yes. I gotta earn that love. Cause it's like, you hear the name Baruti Kefele, what's, what's, what's he gonna be talking about? And then, you know, some folks know my work and it's, but, but, the, but the fact of the matter is, I don't have an audience that's necessarily there that loves Principal Kefele. So I'm walking into an audience where there might be a great deal of hostility in the room. So now in order for me to meet my objective, I got to win that audience over. I don't think I had to come in here and try to win folks tonight. That's right. Right? But see, a lot of the work I do, I got to win folks over. Because as I say to folks all the time, this world I'm in as a consultant, even though the children, are, the, 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 the children on the other side of what I do are black children, Latino children, this world that I'm operating within, this is not a black world by any stretch of the imagination, right? Somehow, I've gotten into that other world in order to reach our kids. That's not easy to do. So, I'm saying all that to say this. This thing, taught in terms of reaching our kids, it's easy, but it's difficult at the same time. And it takes some special people to get it done. Yes. But when we got entrepreneurs, community people, all the capacities in this room, and you make a conscious attempt to partner with schools. So, because see, I'm Jalil, and I'm, and I'm growing up in my hood. And, 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 and my neighborhood is shaping me, my values. So now I come into this classroom, and now, teacher, you, 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 you bring in your middle class values to this classroom, and, and your middle class lesson that you put together. And now I'm dealing with my world, and I'm dealing with my reality, whatever that might be. And now you want me excited every day about your, teacher, do you know what it's like to live my life? 
Do you know what it's like to walk in my shoes for 24 hours? Teacher, I challenge you to put my shoes on for 24 hours. I bet you can't do it. Now that's something I tell teachers every day. I say, toward building relationship with staff, with students, try putting their shoes on for one day. I challenge anyone in the room, I say, put them on for one day, because you got some kids that are dealing with stuff. That's right. So if kids are dealing with stuff, imagine when you and I, we partner with the school to help bring about some balance so that what you're saying becomes real for me because right now with what I'm dealing with, what you're saying in terms of me becoming, becoming an entrepreneur or developing the skill, that's not my world. It's not real for me. It's not concrete. So Principal Kefele, I, I, I leave it to Raz and, and Brother Larry to deal with all the macro systemic stuff. But Principal Kefele, he can't deal with that. He's so micro and all I wanna do I mean, and I say take this to my grave. All I want to do is fire up some kid. That's all. That's all I want to do. That's what I wake up in the morning to do every day. All I want to do is fire up some kid. And if I can fire up that kid, then it opens the door for what you said. And Larry and, and, and Mar Baraka, y'all can change systems. And you make it easy for me. I can't do that. That's not my lane. I can't do what you do. I'm out of my lane. But if I could just go to some kid and spend a couple days with him in the school and get him excited, and he says, man, I can fly. I didn't know I could fly. Then I've done my job. That's what I do. Let's not, let's not be right there. Let's not be right there. All right, one, one, one last question. One last question. Thank God for you. Yeah. And you too. But, you know, you got me a little confused for a minute there. Because what you said sounds like Title II, Chapter 1 in 1990. That they had in New Jersey. That never worked. What was that? Bringing business people from the community into the school system. Oh, oh, oh. That, that, but chapter that's, 1, Chapter 1 in 1990 but, they started. But that's just a component. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm going to say this real short. That program, I have a, a curriculum right. that I wrote for it. See, it's just like, when I was in East Orange before Amistad was even in existence, in, in 1995, I wrote a district-wide, see, folks gotta be bold and audacious. I went to the superintendent of schools in East Orange somewhere around 94, 95, and said, we need a curriculum that addresses our kids. So I went, I was a teacher. I went on it, he, he said, well go ahead and write it. I wrote the curriculum, used Malefi Asante's text called uh, um, Journey of Liberation as the standard text for that book. That curriculum, I spent an entire summer, summer writing a kindergarten through 12th grade curriculum. So, so East Orange had that, I don't know if they still have it, but every teacher that taught social studies in that city had that curriculum. When I became principal, I went to that superintendent in East Orange and said, allow me to Africanize this school. I said, if you are sojourning his school now, I said, if you allow me to do this, I promise you that our test scores will be the highest in the, in the city of East Orange. I said, I promise you. So now he said, go ahead. So for those of you in the room, didn't know Anthony Browder, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. That was a required text at grade seven at Sojourner Truth Middle School. I mandated that. Malefi Asante's text, A Journey of Liberation. Now, sister, sister, you had, you had hang, hang your on. chance. That's enough, that's enough, that's enough. So now, that was mandated. So now, supplemental text, Ivan Van Sertima, George G.M. James. Shekhan Tadia, John Jackson, and, and Dr. Jeffries was a regular visitor in the school, right? So now, what happened, and, 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 and um, Dr. Gunther, so the two of them, and also a brother down in New Brunswick whose name is escaping me right now, but Brother Celine, but then in, in Fadisha. So now, 
There you go. How's that? That's my brother. Regulars in the school. So now what happened with the test scores? Well, when those sixth graders became eighth graders because of the context of the school, it wasn't just those courses in social studies. Language arts became culturally responsive. Math became culturally responsive. Science became culturally responsive. So now, when those sixth graders became eighth graders, not only did, did that school become the number one performing school in East Orange, it was the number one school of, of comparable demographics in the entire state of New Jersey in 2002. So we knew that the reason why was because we provided young people with a curriculum where they saw themselves. So now you couple bringing brothers and sisters into the school who are supplementing what it is that they're getting in curriculum. Kids can't fail. I don't care if you blood, you crip, you Latin King, you MS-13, it don't matter. Because now we're going to offset that with a knowledge of who you are. I'm done. Thank you, brother. Is there enough time? I told you, Give brother and a big hand. And you need to fail it. Give him a big hand. Give him a big hand. We are, we are not finished uh, tonight. Uh, we, we do have some business uh, to take care of with regards to uh, the People's Organization for Progress. Um, in the spirit of um, the United Front, if there are representatives here from other organizations, you'd like to stand up and identify yourself in the organization. Stand up and uh, say who you are and what group you're with. Sheree, I'm in hotel. Oh yeah. That was New Black Panther Party and New York Anti Violence Coalition. Any other organizations want to be identified? Yes. A. Philip Randolph Institute. I'm Jerry Owens, president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute. Give him a big hand. That's my long time friend, Jerry Owens. And Freehold. And Freehold. That's his kind. Yes. I love this guy, and I love what he does. I support him 100%. Thank you, Jerry Owens. Yes. We do organic honey, we do organic gardening now, we got our own building on South Ninth Street where the brothers have always been. That Panthers meet there every week. That's right. That's Brother Kosaka Wing, chairman of Reefa. Our comrade. <laughs> yes. Way back there. Go ahead. <laughs> Statewide organization who organized issue of solitary confinement in our prisons and jails. Mr. Ellison here is a member as well. And uh, what we need mostly in Newark. So uh, we're allies. Give a big hand. That's Jean Cross. She's in the prisons doing prison reform big time. Give her a big hand. She's fighting all those injustices in the prison. Yes. New Brunswick and NAACP, give him a big hand. Who else? Who else is here? Yes. Hello, uh, I'm Yvonne Way. I'm the New Jersey State uh, NAACP Youth and College President. Um, and I'm trying to gather some youth under the age of 25 to help get on my state committee to tackle the educational issues, as well as some other issues like gun violence, uh, social entrepreneurship, healthcare issues, and anything of the sort. So if you guys are under the 20, 80, 25, or even elder, by the 25 to come on my board, please speak to me. And then I'll see guys from anyone else as well. Uh, thank you for the vote. NAACP State Youth Committee. Lawrence. I'm Jersey State Federation for Women's Clubs Incorporated statewide. We're headquarters in Trenton. I'm from Newark, West Wards. Uh, but I also work with the Jersey Symphony Orchestra. Uh, downtown Newark and throughout the state of New Jersey the state officers. But we have young people coming in from schools now and they will spend six weeks and they change. One one day a week, kid comes to the orchestra and does all the clerical work. 
They come, they leave their school, they come to downtown. Some schools are doing this. They're taking the kid one day a week and they're coming to a downtown building. Next kid comes day, one day a week in the next office. And they're coming in all over. There's a school that's doing this. These kids are all over downtown one day a week learning. Great. And it's like apprenticeships. Great. I'm also the East Orange Education Foundation, East Orange Historical Society. But I've been here all my life, I graduated arts high school, and I continue to be here. I love my city. All right, give a big hand. Is that it? Over there. Monica Hall from the Abbott Leadership Institute, doing great work. We are good friends with Abbott, yes. Mr. Davis, in addition to being a member of COP, I'm also a member of the Black and Black Coalition, and I happen to be chair of its health care working group. And I just want to say that in the same way that we talk about the, the abuses and the transgressions that go on within the judicial system, the educational system, we must bring to the fore what is going on with this so-called health care system, and we must embrace the concept of revolutionary health care because not doing so is literally killing us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. local station board. We need funds. We need volunteers. Now is the time really to step forward and step up so that the station can remain strong. That's right. John Brinkley, local chair of the local board of the BAI. This is Michelle Bay. I am the educational co um, consultant as well as co-founder of Winning in Spite of Learning Center as well as, believe it or not, the White Terrace, the Clinton Place, the West Runyon, Power to the People Civic Association, right here in New York. Wow. Give a big hand. That's just like Bay. Dave. Hey, my name is David Cumberford, and uh, one of the regulars around here with uh, POP, but I also work with the Coalition to Save Our Homes, which uh, functions mainly in Irvington. There's been some very, uh, around the issue of uh, uh, stopping foreclosure and getting some economic justice for homeowners. And I wanted to say that just this past week in Irvington, there was a major betrayal of democracy on the part of the city council of Irvington, who took a process that's in uh, uh, moving forward to offer mortgage principal relief, like a municipal program where Irvington could do that locally. But the city council sold out the people, uh, sided with Wall Street, and is trying to put this issue of uh, mortgage uh, principal relief into the deep freeze. There's totally Wall Street in, in, uh, interference. It's a total betrayal of the urban community. And so there's a big struggle. You know, it's only raised the level of struggle in Irvington. And uh, please stay tuned. Uh, you'll hear more. Uh, the same kind of program is also going to be introduced in Newark to the city council. Uh, there's an innovative use of a dirty word, eminent domain, to mm -hmm. kind of turn it around and be used as a tool of mortgage principal relief. So uh, right. you'll be hearing about this idea in New York as well. But, uh, you know, it's really uh, the, the pitch of people's struggle in Irvington is rising very high. And that's all Coalition to Save Our Homes. Give them a hand. All right. We, we are forced at this moment, we are forced the tyranny of the clock because we got to be out of here, but we do have to take care of some regular POP business uh, before we get out of here. We're supposed to be out of here at 9 o'clock. It must be like 9 o'clock already, right? Quarter up. All right. Um, at this point, I just want to remind people, tomorrow is the anniversary of the Denmark Vesey Slave Revolt in South Carolina. That's right. And the 31st, the day after that, is the anniversary of Black Wall Street, the bombing of the black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 